All right, all right. I had a little time waiting on some information from a customer. Got time to do a quick short video. At the end, I'm going to do a chapter one out of one of my other audiobooks that I've got. And I'll tell you more about it right before we get into that first chapter. But right now, let's jump into the video. A couple of stories. Hope you enjoy it. All right, here we go. Okay, this first story is from a police officer. Uh, he'll tell you this in the email, but he wants to keep his name out of it. No problem. Here's what he writes. You can share my story, but due to my profession, I would prefer to stay anonymous. I'm a police officer who works weekends. I have a wife and four kids. Between them and my work, I don't have much time to myself. However, back in January of 2017, I got the opportunity to go hunting and I stole away for a short trip. My days off are Wednesday and Thursday, so I figured I would have the woods to myself. I drove about 150 miles north to hunt the Davy Crockett National Forest west of Lovkin, Texas. This is an area where I spent many hours hunting when I was young, and I love this area. Knowing it was going to be a quick trip, I took only the essentials. To make things easier for myself, I plan to camp in my pickup truck. What? All right, my dog's barking here. Chunk, where are you barking at? He just barks sometime for no reason. Uh, must have been around 11 p.m. when I got to where I wanted to camp. It was an unpaved forest road, literally a dirt road. It was off a two-lane blacktop country road in the middle of nowhere. It stretched about three miles from the blacktop to where it dead-ended in the woods. I passed one other camp as I drove in. It was about half a mile from the country road. I drove all the way to where the road ended in the woods, and we were about two and a half miles apart. I backed my truck into the spot that wouldn't cause me problems if it rained, and I went about setting up what little camp I needed. That consisted of lighting the kerosene lantern and hanging it in a nearby tree. Then I settled in for the night in my back seat. It was around 1 a.m. when I awoke to the sound of pine cones dropping on the roof of my truck. I thought it was strange that a squirrel would be cutting pine cones in the dark. But it was 1 in the morning and I had been sleeping, so I didn't give it much thought. I dismissed it and closed my eyes. A short time later, a loud bang on the side of the truck startled me out of my sleep and scared the crap out of me. I sat upright looking around in the dark, trying to get my bearings. I took my pistol and my police light, and I got out of the truck to investigate. There was no one around. The other camp was two and a half miles north, back up the dirt road. The next nearest road was roughly six miles east, straight through the woods. I looked around, but I neither saw nor heard a thing. I inspected my truck, and I found a big dent below the gas cap on the driver's side. Lying on the ground was a baseball-sized rock the obvious weapon of destruction. The ground is sand and covered in pine straw. The road is red clay, and there are no rocks, at least none that size. I thought about this for a minute. Rocks don't fall out of trees, and squirrels definitely don't throw them. I knew it had to be a person or something with hands. Once I was satisfied that there were no people around, I decided I didn't want to go find the other possibility. So I drove to the other end of the road near the blacktop and spent the rest of the night there. I never thought much about Bigfoot before that night. I still have that dent in my truck and the rock from nowhere that made it. I will let you make up your mind where the rock came from. But it is a night I will never forget. Oh, that was good. That You know, sometimes these stories that don't have just a physical encounter a sighting or whatever but there's enough evidence that you know that you can rule out everything else except something like a bigfoot and they're kind of it's kind of spooky i mean just imagine being in your truck and a rock crashing into the to the side of your truck while you're laying in it asleep oh man i mean these stories uh, you you all are such good writers 
and you have such cool experiences and i appreciate all of you for sending them in especially this one this is uh this is just one of those they're different these are different stories they're not all in your face the cookie cutter type stories they're just good and they give all kinds of evidence and they make you think i think that's why i like this story but to the police officer who wrote it thank you sir for writing it we all enjoyed it appreciate you Here is a short story from a woman who doesn't want to give her name, but here's what she writes. Stories about her husband. Here's what she writes. Back in 2012, when my husband was in college in Utah, he was in the ROTC program. One night, he had to perform a nighttime land navigation exercise. This meant he and a buddy had to take to the trails at night and find points on a map with a specific territory. On the night in question, they headed up to Provo Canyon, where they were to complete their task. The maps they were given had two different coordinates on them, so they walked the trail together until it was time to part ways. With no more than a red headlamp, my husband headed off into the dark towards a small valley on the mountain, and his friend went in a different direction. As he approached the opening in the forest that led into the valley, my husband heard a whistle coming from the tree line. It was around 4 or 5 a.m. by now, so he thought perhaps it was a bird. He stopped and listened for a moment, but when he didn't hear anything, he continued to the opening. He stopped again when he heard another whistle. Again, he heard nothing more and continued on. As soon as he began to walk, he recognized the distinct sound of someone or something paralleling him. He quickly realized that whatever was out there would walk only when he walked and it stopped when he stopped. Between that and the whistles, he was becoming a bit unnerved. However, he knew he had to complete his assignment, so he kept going. When he heard the third whistle, he stopped and assessed his situation. He was alone except for the unseen whistling stalker, and he had no way of knowing if there was only one or if there were a group of them. He looked down at his map and decided those points were not as important as his safety, so he turned and walked out of there as quickly and calmly as he could. When he met up with his buddy for the final checks, he asked if he had been in the opening at the top of the mountain. No, his buddy replied. Why? My husband was reluctant to tell him the story, so he just said he felt like someone was watching him when he was up there. His buddy seemed satisfied with that explanation, and they left. My husband has never spoken of this event to anyone other than me and our children. He is in the Army, so if he did come forward, it could cause him problems. One last thing, Big Springs Park is located in Provo Canyon, And there have been many reports of whistlers there. Just another, you know, circumstantial encounter. I mean, what parallels you in the woods and whistles at you? It walks when you walk, it stops when you stop, and it whistles at you. I don't blame this guy for turning around and going back. I mean, if it was a life and death mission, wasn't a training mission, you know, he he would have had to keep going. I think he made a smart move heading back and his buddy understood and everything was kind of laid to rest. He still serves in the army, so he he's still the man. That's got to be scary. In the dark, walking in the woods, something whistling at you. And these whistles, you know, we hear about this, but it's a distinct whistle from what I understand. It's like a human whistling at you at a close distance. And it's, it's very audible in your ear. It's not an ambient sound, and it's not room noise or forest noise. It's a direct whistle at you. And then to hear something parallel him, I'm being redundant here, I know, but it's just these mystery-type stories or cryptic-type stories really intrigue me as much as the other stories that are full frontal face-on encounters. So... Ma'am, thank you for sending that. I know your husband told you that story, and you were so nice to take the time to write it down and share with all of us, and we appreciate it. Thank you. You know, I told you all I went to a wedding last Saturday. I took a good hot shower before I got dressed to go, put on my sport coat and necktie, and I haven't taken a shower. This is Tuesday. Yeah, it's Tuesday. I finally took another shower today. So from Saturday to Tuesday, I didn't have to take a shower because I was clean. 
because I use Yeti Bar soap. You guys need to check Yeti Bars out. Yetibars.net or Yeti Bars on Facebook. Use the code DC10 at checkout and get a 10% discount. The bars are bigger, they're cheaper, and they're better. Yetibars.net. This email at the end, the woman uh, writes, I do ask that you please use my name. But I'm going to roll the dice here and I'm going to say that she meant I do ask that you please not use my name because I don't want to uh, err. I, I want to err on the side of caution. So I'm not going to say her name, but when she hears it, she'll know it's her story. And if it's in real important to you that your name be out there, ma'am, just send me an email and I'll I'll follow up in another another video and tell everybody your name. But here's her story. It's really good. The first paragraph is kind of about how she got to sending her. A lot of times I'll leave this out when they say, oh, we love your channel and all this stuff. And I appreciate all that. I just don't want to make it about me. I hope you understand that. But I'm going to read it because, okay, I'll just shut up and read it. I've been listening to your channel for quite some time now. I really love how unbiased you are. Something in your voice gives me a down-home feeling that causes me to feel safe. Because of that, I decided it was time for me to write to you about something that happened to me a long time ago. I'm 60 years old now, and this happened when I was a young girl. I had an aunt and uncle who met in the service. He was from the Midwest, like me, and she was from Oregon. They lived near our family for the first several years of their marriage, but eventually they moved to the Pacific Northwest. I had always lived in a farming community. It was a sheltered life away from anything that wasn't about farming. My world was filled with cornfields, soybean fields, and hay fields. The most exotic aspect part of my life was with the Amish youngster who lived in our community. I loved animals, but as a farm kid, those animals were limited to livestock such as cows, pigs, and chickens. We had dogs and cats too because they served a purpose on the farm. We didn't go camping, so I never spent time in the woods. That limited my experience with wildlife to whatever animals wandered onto the farm, mainly deer, rabbits, and of course the dreaded snakes that were always coming up from the creek next to our home. Eventually, we visited my mother's baby brother and his family on the West Coast. I knew I was about to enter a whole new world the moment I got on the first plane. I sat between two real-life hippies. By the time we arrived in Oregon, I realized this adventure would bring many new things to all of my senses. I was ready for anything. For the first few days we were there, we explored the city where my relatives lived. It was exciting and a different from my hometown in many ways. After that, we began to travel the fun coastal towns. I got to explore cabins where sea lions lived, and I saw whales spouting out in the bay. By the time we hit the beach, I had seen so many creatures, nothing surprised me. We ended up on a stretch of the beach where we were the only people for as far as the eye could see. It was my mother and my brother and me, along with my aunt and uncle and two cousins. Even though I was the oldest of the kids, I wasn't 10 yet. As the day drew on and it began to get quite chilly, we gathered up driftwood so we could build a fire. There were cliffs and rocks everywhere I looked. This was the first time I had ever seen the ocean, and it was amazing. We kids played in the sand and splashed on the water's edge, and we found shells and dug for clams and enjoyed this wondrous new world. As we went about our day, I remember seeing two exceptionally large black creatures who peeked out from behind some rocks to watch our group. No one else seemed alarmed. Maybe no one else noticed them. I don't know. So I figured if they were just more of the new wildlife to go along with all the other strange and remarkable new critters I had experienced on that incredible trip. One of the animals seemed taller than the other, but to a young child like me, they both looked big. The smaller one was in those rocks most of the day. It just seemed to enjoy watching us play. Later, as we began to pack up, I watched them walk away. It was then that I realized they were walking on two legs, much like we did. 
I had no idea what they were, and it didn't occur to me to ask. I never smelled them, and I never heard them make a sound. Until they walked into the rocks, I just saw their faces. It would be several years when I was 13 before I had an inkling of what I had seen that day. My mother took me to see a movie, another first for me. It was a documentary called Bigfoot. It included the Patterson-Gimlin film, and as I watched it, I wondered if I had seen the same kind of creatures on the beach that day. I realized then that whatever I had seen, they were no regular animals. My mother never spoke a word all the way home from that film. I never knew if anyone else had seen those things that day. I've always wondered, though, if my mother had seen them too, and that was why she had taken me to see the movie. On those days, we simply didn't open up and talk about things like folks do today. I know my mama believed, and I'm pretty sure my grandparents did too. They mentioned the boogeyman more than once in my life. Eventually, I forgot about those creatures who quietly watched us on the beach that day. All right, I got a chicken coming in here. Get, get. Oh, she's a sassy one. She got after my little hairless dog today and i heard him yelping uh she's the youngest child i'm sorry she's our youngest chicken and she is full of salt uh let me start over eventually i eventually i forgot about those creatures who quietly watched us on the beach that day that is until i found your channel this winter that's when i began to wonder if i could have had a real encounter i've never really talked about this to anyone until recently I mentioned it to a few of my children, but they thought it was just my childhood mind that had imagined it all. I do, however, have a daughter-in-law who has a grandfather who once saw what he believes to be a Bigfoot. Every adult on the beach that day is gone now, so I will never have the opportunity to ask them. But I decided to share it with you because you seem safe. And then she signs her name. I'm glad you felt safe to send it. And these are these stories. Look, I got an email the other day, and people were. Uh, some guy was saying, "Man, why? Aren't, what happened to all the exciting stories? What happened to this and that?" And I'm like, "What are you talking about? I've done these kind of stories since I started this channel. I know the first five to ten videos I did were, you know, in those were stories that I had been told. They're just kind of in your face, you know, scary stories." And we've got some of those coming up, but these people take the time to write these emails to me and I'm by God going to read them. I'm going to share them with people. I'm way behind. I'm always behind. But this, this story is great. This, uh, how many people out there have, uh, they're just quiet people. They're not vocal people. They're not uh, look at me kind of people. They're not me monsters, but they think about things like this woman did way back in their childhood and she's 60. So, I mean, you're, you're talking about 50 years ago. She said she was almost 10. And, and they remember these things, and it, and it bugs them. Uh, it bugs them all those years. And it must feel great to fire off an email and actually hear this read back to you and to have been able to have told the whole world what you saw. And nobody criticizes you. Nobody calls you an idiot. Nobody calls you the, an overactive imagination because, you know, in our little circle of friends, our people, we all listen to these stories and there's no judgment. It's just something that happened in someone's life and they're sharing it now. And I know that sometimes we get stories that are, uh, I'm getting trolled. In other words, people are just making stuff up, but I can't distinguish between the two. There's no way to know, but this one, what does this woman have to gain from writing this story? It's a mild, mild form of therapy. Not that I'm trying to help anyone in a therapeutical way or a therapy way, that's not my mission. That's not my goal. My goal is to only read stories. But it, I bet it is a little bit therapeutic to just write this out, send it off to someone and hear it read back to them and know that, you know, 10, 15, 20,000 people actually heard the story. I don't know why I went off on that. I'm talking too much, but uh, I was just, uh, every, these things pop in my head and I just kind of talk about them. And I'm going to leave all this in the video. A lot of times I edit this stuff out, but not this time, because I think it's important 
And it made me think of that email. We're all the exciting stories. You know, if you don't like the stories I'm reading, you can go to another channel. You can go to the channel that does all the exciting stories. But this is what we do. We share people's encounters. I don't care how benign, how bland, how vanilla they are. If you send me an email and it's written in a cogent way that uh, myself and Neoma and I can make heads or tails out of it, we're going to edit it. We're going to get it in good order. And we're not going to change the story. We're just going to get it in a readable fashion. And I'm going to share it with people on this channel. All right. That's enough talking. 11 minutes, five minute story and six minutes of me yakking. But thank you to the woman who sent it. It was a lovely story. Great story. Great memory, actually. It wasn't a scary memory. But I really appreciate these stories. And if you have just a you know, a vanilla type encounter of something that you think may have been odd and it's been on your mind for all these years, send me an email. I'm going to eventually get to all these stories. So thank you, man, for sending this story. Let's move on. This last segment, I think this chapter of this book is about 15 minutes long, but here's what it is. It's one of the, it's the first chapter, of one of the other audio books I've done. It's Number two in a series of what are going to be three novellas that Bobby Clark has written. The name of the series is The White Mountain Bigfoot. The first in the series is The Oasis, which is out on audiobook, Audible, and iTunes. And the second book in the, in the series of The White Mountain Bigfoot is called Broken Arrow Ranch. And that is what we're reading today because I've already done the first two chapters of uh, The Oasis. So I'm going to do the first chapter of Broken Arrow Ranch. Don't buy this one first if you enjoy reading things in a series. Buy the Oasis first, then buy Broken Arrow Ranch. You can find all these links on my website, DixieCrypted.com. Scroll down just a couple of notches and you'll see all the audiobooks that we have available here. Uh, I, that's about all I can say, but I hope you enjoyed this first chapter of Broken Arrow Ranch. Bobby Clark did a great job on these, and I can't wait to narrate the third one. He's working on it now. So I hope you enjoy it. Go to my website, DixieCrypted.com. Take a look at all the audio books we have, and let's get rolling with this first chapter. Thanks for bearing with me. Man, I'm just full of words today. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I had too much coffee. All right, here we go. Chapter 1. Robbery The trail Zacchaeus and I followed was really nothing more than an occasional scar on the rocky surface of the plateau left by the iron shoes on the horses ridden by Preacher and his gang. The trail was about a day old. Even Zacchaeus's keen nose struggled at times to pick up a scent. He was like a good hunting dog. Put him on a scent and he would stay with it until he found who or what he was looking for or the trail went cold. I watched as Zacchaeus jogged along leading his horse. He had grown at least six inches since I first met him about four months ago. Sometimes I still had to pinch myself to make sure I wasn't dreaming when I looked at him. He was a white mountain Bigfoot. Up until that moment when his parents, Samson and Delilah, as I had named them, had saved my life by pulling my horse Blackie off me from where we had fallen, I had learned that Bigfoot was not just stories told around the campfire. They were real. I had paid them back by going into Mexico with Zacchaeus to rescue Echo, Zacchaeus' little sister from slave traders. We had found another prisoner and rescued her and two kids as well. Zacchaeus and I had become friends during that dangerous trip, each saving the other one's life. We were still not able to communicate well, but we managed. We didn't understand who we were hunting or why. I doubted he cared anyway. When I had ridden into the oasis to ask him to come with me, there was no hesitation. He simply saddled his horse and rode with me. There was no one else I would rather have by my side when hunting down outlaws than Zacchaeus. He had proven himself to be capable and loyal during the rescue in Mexico. We were now on the trail of Preacher and his gang. 
a thought back to the events of yesterday that led up to the trail we were now following. It had happened right at dusk. I was in the mercantile picking up a few things for Charlie when I heard the first gunshot. It sounded like it had come from across the street at the bank. Looking out the window, I saw Sheriff Wilson lying on his back on the boardwalk in front of the bank. There was a man stepping from the open bank door with a smoking pistol in his hand. He stood for a brief moment looking down at the sheriff and then shot him in the head point blank before turning and walking back inside. I immediately ran towards the bank, my Colt Peacemaker in my hand. Deputy Carter came running up the boardwalk. Looks like a bank robbery, I yelled to him as he came up. Seeing me, he motioned for me to take the front door while he went around back. Gun in hand, I stepped carefully through the front door. Moments later, I heard a flurry of gunshots come from out back, followed by the sound of horses galloping away from the back of the bank. Moving carefully but quickly through the bank, I stepped out the back door to find Deputy Carter lying on the ground, clutching a bleeding leg. We had missed them but not before Deputy Carter shot one of them. In the hail of gunfire, he had been wounded in the leg. The wounded outlaw began to talk when he realized his boss had left him. The story of my rescuing Charlie and the kids had been told with Zacchaeus' part in the rescue being left out for obvious reasons, the end result being that I was regarded as somewhat of a hero and a gunfighter, a reputation I did not want. When the mine owner, Bill Stansberry, had asked me to recover the stolen payroll, I was reluctant. I only agreed because I needed the reward money if I was ever going to be able to provide for Charlie and the kids. She had agreed to marry me, and we wanted to adopt seven-year-old Laura and five-year-old Daniel. They were the children Zacchaeus and I had rescued along with Charlie. Charlie's real name was Elizabeth Carter, no relation to Deputy Carter but I still called her Charlie. Feeling like a fool, I shifted my weight in the saddle again, easing my stiff back. The sun beat down on us unmercifully. I had learned to trust Zacchaeus' ability on the trail. He was a master tracker. Sometimes I thought he had to have a sixth sense because he would go for hours without seeing anything that I could identify for certain as the trail left by preacher but Zacchaeus rarely seemed uncertain. We were deep in the White Mountains now, and I was becoming more and more uneasy. We were in the heart of Apache country, and I had no desire to have my scalp hanging in some brave's teepee. Suddenly, Zacchaeus stopped and looked around, sniffing the air like a hound dog. Walking towards a clump of sagebrush, he looked carefully at it, Reaching down, he pulled the sage up easily. It had been dug up and the cook fire placed under it. Preacher had gone to a lot of trouble to hide the campsite. The sagebrush had been placed back over the charcoal from the cook fire and sand sprinkled around to cover all the evidence of digging. Preacher was good. I'll give him that. Once again, I found myself being glad that Zacchaeus was with me. He had proven himself repeatedly during the rescue of his sister as well as Charlie and the kids. We camped that night in a pocket among some boulders. I lay there on my bedroll staring up at the stars. I was remembering the way Charlie looked the first time I saw her in a dress. She had disguised herself as a boy before being kidnapped and had been able to avoid a much worse fate while being held prisoner by the outlaws. Remembering how I found out she was a girl made the heat rise in my cheeks. I was glad Charlie wasn't here to see it. She always laughed about it with that low, soft laugh that made my heart skip a beat whenever I heard it, but it still embarrassed me. The sun was just coming up when we hit the trail again. I thought we had gained a few hours on Preacher yesterday. Blackie flicked an ear backwards towards me as if to say he thought I was crazy and I was starting to wonder if he was right. Zacchaeus seemed as confident as ever. I wish for the thousandth time that I could talk to him to understand what he was thinking. The sign language that we had worked out got us by and we were getting better at it. He was growing bigger all the time. 
The muscle mass on his shoulders and chest reminded me of his father. Samson stood nine feet tall with shoulders nearly four feet wide. I knew I could never tell anyone about them or they would think I was mentally ill. Zacchaeus had the same thick coat of two-inch long coarse black hair that his father did. His forehead sloped back from his brow line with black deep-set eyes above a flat nose and wide mouth. His face, hands, and feet were the only part of him that was not covered in hair. We followed the trail for three more days, pushing hard from daylight till dark. Mid-morning of the fourth day, we found Preacher's last camp. As always, the cook fire had been hidden under a sage bush. This time, the coals were still warm. They had been here just a few hours ago. We would have to start being extra careful. The last thing we needed was to run into an ambush, whether it was Apache or Preacher's gang, Taking out my spyglass that I had picked up on a battlefield from a dead Union officer, I scanned as much of the terrain as I could see. I was careful to shield it from the sun to keep it from giving our position up. The country was rough and broken and would be easy to lose an entire army in. We were only looking for four men. That night we camped at the Carrizo Creek. I knew we were close and I had a bad feeling. I think Zacchaeus felt it too because he kept cautiously looking around and sniffing the air. We built no fire that night for fear Preacher might see it. On a hunch, I made my bedroll up to look like I was in it, and then I slipped back into the boulders and bedded down. Zacchaeus had disappeared as well. I knew he would be where he was needed. The night was ghostly quiet the only sound that was made by a soft wind moving the leaves as it slipped stealthily past. Something was out there. It was too quiet. I found a comfortable spot among the nest of boulders on the hillside overlooking the camp, and I waited. It was just past midnight, and I had dozed off when the sound of a rifle shot broke the stillness. The thud of the bullet into my empty bedroll left no doubt about the unknown rifleman's intention. The shot had come from higher up on the slope and about 150 feet to my right. I waited and listened, being wishful of not giving up my location until I knew who and how many were out there. I kept still. Rifle at the ready, I waited. The moonlight made it easy enough to see and get around. For several minutes, there was nothing but the wind and the leaves, and then there was movement in the brush near my empty bedroll. A figure slipped carefully out of the shadows and moved slowly to my bedroll. Reaching out with his rifle barrel, he poked the lump in my bed. A curse made it obvious that he had found the rocks in the bedroll and knew I wasn't there. The ambush had failed. I knew this would be the perfect chance to take out whoever it was there with a shot, but I could not bring myself to shoot out of the dark like that. Suddenly, Zacchaeus was there behind the dark figure standing over my bedroll. As the ambusher turned to leave, he ran square into Zacchaeus' massive chest and bounced back a step. Zacchaeus leaned forward and let out a roar just inches from the ambusher's face. The man dropped his rifle and screamed out of sheer terror. Knowing Zacchaeus could kill the man with his bare hands, I called out and hurried down to him. The man was sitting on the ground where he had fallen, shaking with fear. I couldn't blame him. Meeting Zacchaeus in broad daylight would be enough to scare any a brave man. But under the circumstances, the reaction was no surprise. I remembered my first meeting with Samson and Delilah. Removing the man's six-shooter and knife, I quickly tied him hand and foot. What's your name? I asked him. Ted, he stammered shakily. You ride with Preacher, I ask. Well, that's none of your business, he said, getting some of his courage back. Okay, I said calmly, stepping back. I motioned to Zacchaeus and told the man, Zacchaeus can have you then. Zacchaeus stepped forward and let out a deep growl that still made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. It had the desired effect on Ted. No, stop, he nearly screamed. Yes, I ride with Preacher. Where is Preacher and the others? I asked. About five miles north of here, Ted said. Where's the money from the payroll? I asked. 
preacher has it. He said he would hold my share of it for me until I got back. He spotted you from a ridge this afternoon. Said I should come back and take care of you. Said he would give me an extra 50 bucks if I did. Ted finished with an uneasy glance at Zacchaeus before asking barely above a whisper, What is that thing? As he nodded towards Zacchaeus. That, I said, is my friend Zacchaeus. He's a white mountain Bigfoot. He does not take kindly to people sneaking around in the dark. Why do you call him Zacchaeus? Ted asked. He don't look none too short to me. You should see his parents, was all I said. Ted gave me a startled look and asked more to himself than me. There's more of them? I tied Ted to a tree in as comfortable a position as possible, and I said, If you so much as try to get away and run, Zacchaeus is going to eat you alive. Come to think of it, I wasn't entirely sure Zacchaeus wouldn't eat him. Tomorrow, I'll decide what to do with you, I told Ted. Get some rest. You're going to need it. The next morning, I put Ted to work cooking beef and bread on the fire while I watered the horses. Zacchaeus had retrieved Ted's horse. After eating and making sure Ted didn't have any weapons in his gear, I told him to mount up and then said, Ted, you ride between Zacchaeus and me. If you try anything, I'm going to let Zacchaeus have you. Ted glanced nervously at Zacchaeus and swallowed. Then he shook his head. No, sir, no trouble. But what are you going to do with me? I glanced meaningfully back at Zacchaeus and then I said cheerfully, We haven't decided yet. Depends on how well you cooperate. For starters, where is Preacher headed? Ted swallowed hard again before muttering, Preacher will kill me if I help you. Well, Ted, I said slowly, The way I see it, you've got two options. Help me and run the risk of Preacher being mad at you or take your chances with Zacchaeus. Ted glanced over at Zacchaeus and shivered. I still can't believe he's real. Preacher's headed up into the badlands of Utah to hide out until things cool down a bit. And I guess you know how to get there, I asked. Yeah, I've been there a couple of times, Ted said. He picked up a stick and drew a crude map in the sand. This was not going to be easy. It was still several hundred miles through Indian country and a lot of rough terrain. We would need supplies, and the closest place I knew of to get them was a mining settlement a few days' ride north. I hadn't heard whether they had named the place or not. We nooned at a small spring in a canyon before continuing on to the mining camp. I left Zacchaeus and Ted a couple of miles out in a small, secluded canyon. A crude, hand-painted sign on a post proudly proclaimed the town's name to be Johnson's Creek. It was a typical mining town, mostly tents and hastily thrown up shacks. The main street was rough and full of wagon ruts. The town would probably die out as quickly as it had started, once the mine petered out, like so many others had. The only two buildings in town were a saloon with a hand-painted sign over the door that said Black Stallion Saloon. The second was a general store built much the same as the saloon out of rough sawn lumber. The sign over the door said Robert's Mercantile. I went into the mercantile and gave the proprietor a list. He was a portly middle-aged man that liked to talk. After a bit of small talk, I asked, You see any strangers around town lately? He glanced at me over his spectacles and said, Not the type any decent sort would want to hang around with. Preacher and a couple of his men came through yesterday. They bought enough supplies to feed a small army and got fresh mounts. Thanks, I said, taking the supplies he had gathered for me. Are there any horses for sale around here? Well, I've got a couple, the proprietor said, leading the way out to a small stable. The long and short of it was I ended up buying a mouse-colored gelding and a pack saddle for the supplies. This was turning into a much longer chore than I had originally planned on. I wanted a bigger horse for Zacchaeus. He had to weigh close to 300 pounds by now and had to alternate between walking and riding. The captured horse from the outlaws in Mexico was a good horse but not big enough for Zacchaeus and he was not done growing yet. There was no sheriff and no jail in the town. The proprietor told me that once in a while a ranger would ride through, but there was no way of knowing when. 
there was talk of a telegraph and possibly a regular stage route by spring. And by the time I got back to the canyon where Zacchaeus and Ted waited, it was late evening and Ted had already set up camp and was cooking supper. I had a few things to do and we ate well that night. We would need it. I had a feeling this was going to be a long trip. Thanks for hanging with me on this video. I know I was a little wordy. I get that way sometimes. Hope you can bear with me. Remember, if you're interested in the audiobooks, go to DixieCrypted.com. Scroll down just a couple of bars. You'll see all the audiobooks for sale. Click on the image and it'll take you to the Audible link. I don't have the iTunes link connected to those images. Maybe I can figure that out in the future, but it takes you to Audible. If you want them on iTunes, you can just look up the title. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you guys on the next video.